So I guess every, all of you are digital nomads. You're digital nomads. I am very digital, but not very nomads because it's very difficult to move. But being Italian and being in Bali, I am a little bit nomad, but it's 19 years that I'm in Bali, so I'm not so nomad. I live in Ubud, which is in the middle of the jungle and inside, far from these places. <clears throat> but we're really the center. Yeah, I, I always with the king I pushing, <laughs> but in the general area of wood. And people from Ubud don't come in the south unless it's a special occasion, usually only to go to the airport and leave. I was shocked to drive with a motorcycle around Changu. I didn't recognize it. I think last time I came here was seven years ago. So where are you guys from? Where are you from? France. France? Yeah. Oh. Are you still alive? I found it in my guest house. All right, OK. Ah, okay, so it's you, all right, yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> good, good. And you're from France or from Quebec? France, France, France. okay, cool. Where are you from? Uh, Canada. Canada. Where, where about? Ottawa. Ottawa, yeah. Ottawa. okay, yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, I speak a little bit of French as well, too, just being in Border Town and Quebec, yeah. All right, cool. I've been in Montreal, I seems to be in Europe. I didn't yeah. feel to be on the other side of the ocean. Yeah. And what about in France? Lille. 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 Okay. I, I had a, a girlfriend in Rouen. Uh, oh, yeah. So. All right, cool. Maybe you know her. <laughs> All right. What about uh, you? I'm from Belarus. Belarus. Amazing. And uh, already two years in Bali, you told me. So you are Bulenese already. What about you? More than 20 years in Asia, okay. But no Bali, though. Singapore, okay. Yeah, Singapore is kind of a cool place, and it's nice to be in Bali because it's very flight, very short flight off here. I did a lot of business in Singapore, actually. It's very good. Yeah. From, from here, exactly here. This five square meters, uh, you were born there in that chair. All right, okay, it happens. Uh, Kalimantan, all right, okay, cool. What about you? Rambali, Bali, okay, fantastic. My wife is Balinese, so I am half uh, Bulenese almost. Yeah, I have one baby that is mixed Bali, Italy. Interesting, okay. Well, who I forgot, but you are also Java, right? Uh, Jakarta, at the airport in Jakarta. <laughs> and you, Bali. Bali, Bali. Where Bali? Um, Sorry? In okay, I have no idea. <laughs> Good, must be Bali nearby. Okay. All right. And now we have our boss with only one shoe. What happened? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. oh, that's quite original, in fact. <laughs> I had a gecko in my shoe since the, the title of a song. I had a gecko in my shoe, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Alright. Yeah, so I was just making friends, you know, like, uh, so. Alright. Yeah, all right. It was quite challenging because I was saying I'm not expert in digi digital nomadi, but uh, I am expert in decentralization. I advocate decentralization. So, um, <clears throat> okay, about me, there is not much to say, or there is a lot to say. So, I, as I was saying, I am working IT since I was a little kid. Uh, I am into decentralization since a long time. 
I'm Italian because nobody's perfect. And uh, <laughs> what can you do? Um, you know, and uh, I like to share about uh, decentralization. So more than all, uh, uh, I want to explain a little bit what decentralization is just to clear up a little bit the idea. Then we see what the digital nomad is, which I don't know, and, uh, and how these two things combine together. So what? Uh, all right. I need to eat the ice cream. Okay. All right. Sorry. That's, that's better, I hope. So decentralization is a phase of uh, the information technology era that we are in, right? Uh, so we started from uh, digitizing things. First it was analog, uh, and then from analog uh, we became digital. So we had, uh, for example, music. Uh, we had uh, videos, movies, cameras, uh, et cetera, et cetera. With digital, we start transmitting things over the internet, uh, networks, right? And uh, <laughs> we have a competitor of music, loud music. Is okay. And uh, anyways, and uh, and then we start using this uh, information uh, highway they call internet, right? Uh, to also purchase services uh, or use services that are all online. And as a fact of the evolution, we are moving toward uh, a way where uh, things are distributed, are no more centralized. It started to centralize. If you think about, uh, um, for example, if we think about emails, at the early, early days, uh, every office, every house has a small mail server, and the mails were uh, just staying there and going from there to the other mail server where they need to be received. Nowadays, uh, we have uh, three or four providers uh, that uh, are giving uh, out uh, emails, so Gmail, Outlook, uh, and so on. All right, <laughs> and uh, why we are moving toward uh, again uh, decentralization of uh, of services? Uh, the big uh, impact has been the blockchain uh, that uh, seems to be a decentralized tool, which is not really, but uh, allow people to interact one with the other without uh, the man in the middle, and that's the biggest uh, biggest evolution. So if before we had uh, the need to go to a third party, like we still do with a lot of service, bank, uh, email itself, and so on and so forth, with a decentralized system, we can interact one to the other without uh, a central point of uh, uh, exchange, somebody that we need to, to trust. So practically, we distribute the power, and there are a lot of very positive uh, aspects uh, uh, for mostly for people that uh, are not fixed in a location, like digital nomads, in fact. Um, it, is, it is something that we like it or not is going to happen, and now with all this uh, Web3 movement uh, is uh, coming more and more. Whenever you see a website that says uh, connect with your wallet, uh, rather than logging in with an account, that's really a first step toward the direction. <clears throat> I did a little bit of an analysis of what a digital nomad needs to, uh, to work properly, right? So a reliable internet connection. And this is uh, not a simple thing, right? Now always go around search for a Wi-Fi or something like this, but uh, Internet connections are really a bottleneck and are a centralized point. If you think of the full country here connected through three or four or five providers of internet. So those providers censor pages, try without a VPN here to connect to Reddit, to connect to Vimeo, to connect to anything else. You can't. It's all censored. Now blockchain.com, a lot of blockchain uh, uh, websites are all blocked. Okay, So... Uh, even internet connection can be decentralized. And the, the person that is doing the biggest job I regard is Elon Musk with Starlink. Starlink is a constellation of small satellites that form a peer-to-peer -peer network one with the other. And with a small dish antenna that can be bought, and 2023 Indonesia is covered as well by this satellite, you connect from your computer straight to 
the Sterling network. And from the Sterling network, you go down to wherever is needed. If it's somebody in the internet outside the Sterling network, then you go through the internet for the rest part. But if somebody with Sterling network, you're really connecting you to them directly without anybody else uh, interfering with your communication. This is uh, a decentralized uh, way to access uh, a communication network that is possibly then being part of the internet. And there are more. When I was a kid, I remember modifying routers. Uh, we were making a sort of a mesh network around town. So you see the Wi-Fi signal, you connect, but you are now in the internet. You are in this uh, local network of server where there were software and other things to share. This is a mesh network. A mesh network are uh, used sometimes to bring internet in uh, remote villages and other places. But it's another access uh, that is decentralized. So it doesn't matter which is the point that you enter. You are in the network, which eventually connect to the internet. So as soon as this trend grows uh, and they are open, uh, more uh, if it is a sort of a club, like when you subscribe to the Wi-Fi service, that wherever you arrive, you connect at the airport with a different company. But with a decentralized uh, approach to the internet, uh, people they open uh, their uh, doors. As a digital nomad, I will find it exceptional to arrive in a place, already know where there are open port for the internet, uh, sit there and connect. Uh, and there are uh, several companies that are trying to push uh, uh, blockchain-based uh, access point uh, for the internet. So whoever provides the internet makes a little bit of income, and uh, it is uh, a mesh network. Uh, Smart Mesh uh, being one of them is a is a friend of mine beside from China that is doing this this work. Then people need a, a portable and functional device. I see the quantity of laptops that there are here, which are a very important things to have, uh, but it's also a big point of failure because going on the motorcycle, the backpack fall off the motorcycle, the notebook is broken, uh, how do we exchange? So there is the importance to have something that uh, I buy a new one and in five minutes I should be ready to work with all my stuff as if it was a, a moment ago. So there are uh, what they call virtual computer, which I can access through the browser where I see a desktop that is not actually saving my computer, is saved remotely. And they are uh, making this also distributed uh, and decentralized. So in this case, I can have uh, uh, sort of a, my computer where I work that is in the uh, distributed uh, cloud, uh, let's say, and uh, access it uh, to run uh, my things, or at least the basic of my things. Uh, doesn't matter which is the computer that I have. A comfortable product uh, working environment that is, is not much decentralized, but people decentralize their spaces. There has been a nice initiative uh, uh, in Venice, Italy, where I'm from, where people, there are houses that can host other people that are nice, a small garden to sit down and work. They created a sort of a group, uh, and every day they meet in another or by week in somebody else's place. Uh, so you have a sort of a decentralized way to have uh, uh, work location without having to actually invest uh, in uh, in an extra one. Um, flexible schedule, this is okay, obviously depending on the work that somebody does in digital manner. Access to necessary software and tools, and this is also important. Uh, when going online, uh, there are the risk of uh, account being blocked, uh, account being cancelled because uh, suddenly you're from an IP of another nation or uh, the IP they're using, people used to do uh, some DDoS, uh, so he's blacklisted, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So many tools, if they are decentralized, do not require uh, the verification of uh, where you are connecting from or other things, the risk to get your account canceled. Um, thinking even just the social media, many people being in the Facebook prison for a month or so just because they posted a statue that was naked or, you know, like the most weird shit. Now, in the centralized social media, uh, the responsibility is uh, for the person that uh, posts and not much uh, for the, uh, sorry, for the person that view, not much for the person that post. It was interesting how uh, Dorsey, the ex-CEO of uh, uh, Twitter, uh, was uh, trying to uh, promote a system for which Twitter is just the interface to access the content, uh, and while the content uh, was uh, in uh, decentralized uh, uh, storage, 
So they say, I have no means to cancel somebody's content. You know, I can just uh, flag uh, the interface for people not to look at it. But uh, removing the responsibility from uh, a central part hosting and distributing content uh, that is uploaded by a user. And this is very important. There are many systems that we're going to see to do this thing, right? <coughs> Communication and collaboration tools. Now there are. Uh, chat uh, like uh, Signal or uh, other things that allow to create uh, uh, video communication and things in a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer manner. Um, people prefer for privacy reason, for avoiding account to be blocked or banned uh, to use those. Uh, and also because um, some of those are not accessed through a central server, a centralized proxy server, which can be blocked. So some country can block a certain messenger uh, we saw, for example, during the Arabic Spring, they block all the uh, communication through social media, et cetera, et cetera. The centralized one, because they're peer-to-peer, -peer, they, they need to block the full network, which will make it impossible for them to actually do it. So they can still accessible in a difficult condition. Um, backup of data. Obviously, there are online storage, uh, like uh, we have a Google Drive rather than other things, but there are the equivalent uh, for uh, um, in the centralized manner. And then finance, and here we have all the cryptocurrency, the centralized finance, et cetera, et cetera, that we know. So putting the two things together, um, the benefit uh, of the centralization for digital now, honestly, as of today, we are at the early stage of all these uh, decentralized services. So unless there is a very precise need, uh, it can become more a pain in the butt to try to uh, force yourself to use uh, something decentralized. But in the next future, means a couple of years from now, mostly because there is all this uh, wave of uh, Web3, Metaverse, uh, et cetera, et cetera, with the, uh, there are tools that, per, that allow people to have uh, an identity in a decentralized manner. And there are more and more that are coming up. Some get recognized by services. So we're going to have uh, the possibility to be recognized with a cryptographic signature. The same method that we use to send cryptocurrency or transfer an NFT will allow us also to sign agreements uh, in a way that is connected to an identity. This is important. Uh, if you think, uh, <clears throat> just to open a bank account somewhere, they ask you the electricity bill uh, of the, with your name, which mm, drive me mad. I am living in Indonesia since 18 years ago. I still have the pulsa to recharge my electricity. I don't have a contract uh, on the phone. I don't have a I don't have nothing to show to these people. Only when I renew my kitas, I have the document with the kitas that is not three months old and they take it. So I have a window of three months per year where I can open bank accounts. <laughs> As, uh, not. But this is one of the examples for which the world is not really prepared for people that don't have a, a fixed address, uh, a fixed things. And uh, as well, uh, when you start operating with these centralized things from different locations, they start flagging your, uh, your traffic and blocking your activities uh, and cannot access the bank account anymore. You need to come in person here. How can I do that? And so on and so forth. So <coughs> the decentralization tools give, uh, in fact, uh, more autonomy and flexibility. Plus, uh, they don't have uh, a central party, so there is nobody that can decide. Uh, you know, I have a company with bank account in Hong Kong, for example. Hong Kong, uh, probably after the few financial drama, they become very crazy with regulators. And every time I try to do a small operation, they start asking me all the document of uh, the company and things, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, I need to do it now. You know, by the time I send you all this, every single time is like this. I say, you are promoting cryptocurrency. You don't know, but doing this to me, blocking me from moving my own money, you are just promoting cryptocurrency because nobody ever stopped me from transferring some Ethereum to somebody else or some USDC to somebody else. And uh, <coughs> this is for sure a reason for somebody that doesn't have a fixed uh, location address, uh, uh, a very good way to move around. Also, when you think you're traveling around, you don't have a, a place where you deposit, uh, how can you cross the border with uh, $50,000 in cash in your pocket? But if they are USDC, then you know you can cross the border, no problem. Um, 
And, and it's also true that uh, depending obviously what work a digital nomad is doing, uh, there is a lot of opening in the world of decentralization where there is a lot of uh, need uh, and uh, recruiting of talent uh, to make uh, these new services uh, better. So I'm not just talking about uh, uh, software developers, but uh, also copywriters uh, rather than, uh, you know, marketers and so on and so forth. So being savvy in these things that is uh, now in the early stage, uh, let's say, allow the opportunity to have uh, a lot of uh, uh, work and get to get in touch with other people, right? <clears throat> okay, again, uh, the the way the identity are managed in a decentralized manner uh, usually don't limit the access uh, to uh, tools. It was funny when at the beginning of the cryptocurrency, the United States had been the first uh, to regulate things, just simply blocking American people from being able to do anything. And it was funny because uh, Bitcoin came there to bank the unbanked, but when it comes to Bitcoin, the unbanked were the American uh, citizen, uh, citizen of the United States that uh, by law could not access uh, all the service that the rest of the world, by law means, because by technical, practical way, they could absolutely easily access it, but uh, if they get caught, they will have uh, trouble. So for sure that uh, it is an opportunity because uh, at the moment, uh, there are a lot of still unregulated the gray areas, uh, so there is uh, open to access anything, just set up a server and be part of it is very easy. There is a lot of use uh, of uh, cryptography, so uh, there is encryption, decryption of data, which uh, guarantees a certain level of uh, uh, privacy with data, even the data stored in uh, remote places. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, opportunities uh, to do work uh, in a proper way. And many services are much cheaper than uh, centralized uh, services, for sure. I put together a little bit of the tools that are more obvious uh, and evident. So nothing special uh, compared to others. Now everybody uses Telegram. Uh, some people are still attached to WhatsApp, uh, uh, but Signal, Signal is being made by the same guy that made WhatsApp. After he sold WhatsApp to uh, Facebook, he wanted to do something that was really related to privacy. Uh, because we you know WhatsApp is one of the other applications where you mention something when you chat and suddenly the advertisement appears to you in, uh, in Facebook when, uh, when you work. So it is for sure uh, another reason to value privacy, mostly if you're working in a project that, that you want him to stay private. And most of the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, application, the decentralized application, have open source code, which means that uh, somebody knows how to code, how to program, uh, how to read code, uh, can go on GitHub uh, and download the source code, uh, modify and uh, do whatever they want with this application, which is uh, quite powerful, okay? Even Telegram, the decentralized, has uh, the open source uh, of the clients and of the server. They wanted to open source the server as well, but... Um, and people can host server of these services. So most of the services that we can use uh, online that are distributed, decentralized, we can run a server of our own if we want to for uh, uh, decentralized storage, uh, for... Uh, uh, communication, chat, uh, video chat, et cetera, et cetera. So there is uh, no tracking, no advertising, obviously it, those are much better uh, service compared to other. For, exa for example, um, decentralized file storage. Now this started with uh, BitTorrent. BitTorrent was this application uh, that came out before blockchain where people can uh, uh, download uh, the, the old, uh, no? that was very criticized because a lot of people downloaded uh, movies uh, and music um, doing copyright infringement. It was interesting because uh, compared to the predecessor, they were all uh, centralized, uh, uh, Kaza, Napster, and so on, where uh, law enforcement went to the guy that managed the server, arrested them, and shut down everything. Uh, BitTorrent was impossible because there was no central server, right? Doesn't matter who make the code, but uh, the code is free speech. And people can execute it, uh, creating a network where even if you take down 
a couple of uh, server, three more will come up in another place. So the regulator have to change their strategy. So from regulating people managing a server and a service, they need to start regulator, regulating the user. So if the service is there, we cannot do much about it, but if we catch you using it, then you get in trouble, right? And, uh, and there is this interesting story at the time, this is before blockchain and all. Um, the major of uh, movies, uh, music, uh, rather than uh, looking at things and say, look, there is a distribution system where we can sell our content to the most remote village uh, in the most remote country of the world where uh, our boxes with DVDs uh, or, uh, uh, you know, movies or CD will never arrive. Uh, and there is the full catalog that we can put it available. They just needed to think a way to make people able to pay for the content. And they, they didn't. They, did, they didn't make this reasoning, right? The difference when uh, cryptocurrency came out. Also, some countries, some central bank got scared and started uh, pushing regulator to ban and make it. Uh, but when you realize that you cannot fight technology, you cannot fight a piece of code. A piece of code don't care. Look at you and say, hey, I'm a piece of code. I'm going to be executed, whatever. But uh, uh, then uh, you try to marry the technology start using it uh, and then uh, you can regulate it uh, that that will be the best uh, and in fact that's what <coughs> most uh, central bank did now all the central bank are there planning their own uh, digital currency you know uh, cbdc is called and uh, there is this huge wave and this is a good way i think in their side uh, to say okay there is this new technology we adopt it uh, and then we make the good one and the rest become the bad one <laughs> so in, in reality they are anyway uh, adapting to the evolution of technology because uh, there is no no way. Banks mostly are victim of the regulators themselves. Uh, uh, regulators don't catch up with technology. I have a very funny story in Singapore, opening bank account. Uh, they make you fill a form by hand. Uh, and uh, this uh, uh, lady that work at the bank, uh, to be nice with me, she fill up the form for me. Then the form uh, that is filled by hand, it actually was in her computer as a PDF, yeah? so she printed out and filled it by hand because it's demanded that you fill it by hand by regulators. They send it via fax in a place where they do the data entry, but for privacy reasons, they cannot give the full piece of uh, page to a single person to do data entry. So the pages are cut in small pieces, uh, so there are different people entering just small part of it, okay? What they did, they put my email address, which is roberto at capodieci.com. My family name, which is capodieci, the A, they thought it was a number two. So they recorded my email address as roberto at c number two podieci.com. So when I had to activate the bank account, I would not receive the email for the activation because it was sent to the wrong email address. So I called the bank, the bank says, you need to download this PDF form, seven pages long, print it, fill it by hands again, <laughs> send it to them. So I, say, I went to register the domain name, c number 2 podicicom <laughs> and I received the email there, and I still, as of today, received the email from the bank to the other domain name, <clears throat> which made my life much easier and fast, and I could activate my bank account immediately. But to say that uh, sometimes uh, big institutions are blocked in their capacity to innovate uh, by rules, uh, I mean, a fax uh, today is still required, and we're in 2023. I don't know who has a fax anymore, right? Uh, fax was good in the past, but uh, not today. <coughs> so the event of all this uh, capacity to do cryptographic signature, to validate data on the user side and now in a central server is uh, something that is starting now, is getting used in more and more services. Uh, and uh, for sure brings a big advantage to people that do work and they're moving around like digital nomads. It's not yet adopted by big banks and other things, but they will eventually catch up and, uh, and do that. Uh, for example, many countries already have the ID card that they include a private key for which we can cryptographically sign things. I divorced uh, over uh, the phone from Bali with the court in Italy signing with my cryptographic uh, signature which is amazing because else I would have gone to a notary, authenticate my signature, the notary is recognized or not, send via FedEx document and so on and so forth. So there is a slow movement in the direction, but it's quite, it's quite slow. <clears throat> then there are the centralized marketplace. 
means places where people can sell their services. So I'm a copywriter and I want to sell my services uh, through uh, decentralized marketplaces. So there are plenty. These places many times uh, accept cryptocurrency as payment as well, which are um, very good uh, deals. And uh, there, because there are people that want to also maintain uh, privacy, pay with uh, crypto and have no issue in doing things. Other people like to sell services to a certain kind of market uh, where uh, there is ease of money. Because in the world of crypto, a lot of people made a lot of money easy and fast. So they are happy to pay premium. So it is uh, an opportunity to make the extra money. <laughs> there are uh, several. There are several that open and then closed. But uh, uh, in general, this is something that is uh, growing. Again, most of these applications are applications that I download in my computer and launch from there. So it doesn't go through the browser exactly because uh, it works directly with uh, a decentralized system, a peer-to-peer -peer system, a blockchain most of the time. <coughs> there is privacy, there is encryption uh, in the communication, and so on and so forth. So maybe many users are not doing the best legal uh, activities in these places, uh, but uh, is part of uh, is part of it. Yeah. Not to be confused with the Silk Road uh, of uh, the Onion Network, which is a completely different thing. That centralized is just uh, through a different kind of access. Here we're talking about decentralized marketplace, so there is no central server. And then uh, there are the social media platform. There is something that is uh, amazing because most of these things, based on blockchain, reward authors. So you write a blog, uh, like in Medium, per se, the equivalent of Medium, but people, rather than clapping hands to you, they actually leave a few cents of a dollar every time they appreciate your content. And people can make a little bit of money on uh, articles, content like videos. Uh, there is a DTube, there is a clone of YouTube, but it's decentralized, they use IPFS. And uh, it's interesting because YouTube is getting more and more critical in how uh, blocking content, canceling, uh, blocking, limiting channels of people just because there is uh, some violation. is uh, It becomes ridiculous to watch YouTuber. There is, uh, they cannot say a lot of words that are uh, like violence, rape, or guns, or whatever, <laughs> in, because their content gets first demonetized. So every excuse not to pay people uh, for YouTube is good. Eh? And uh, it's getting annoying, it's getting terrible. It's, it's like uh, the, the Facebook jail, but uh, here people make money, make a living with their own things. So most people start uploading things both in YouTube and YouTube. So when the content is appearing in a place, there is still the other. And those also uh, monetize, so people can earn uh, if uh, people watch it uh, and uh, you know offer. And there are uh, like blogging things, and there are platforms like Steam, Steam is a platform that allows people to monetize uh, content. And then Steamit uh, is an example, a sort of a Reddit uh, blogging uh, system on top of Steam. Uh, the tube is made on top of Steam, I think, as well. Uh, iOS Tube is a friend of mine that did uh, this huge investment for this uh, decentralized uh, video streaming with artificial intelligence, also very interesting. Um, and there are many more, OK? So those are just a couple of examples. I do upload videos always in YouTube and YouTube as well, just as a backup because it happened to me that uh, YouTube decided the video of mine wasn't good, I don't know why. And uh, in another case, they just canceled completely a channel with no explanation whatsoever, which was very annoying because it was a video of my family, my kids, so nothing even uh, of a YouTuber. But uh, so there is a lot of, uh, and again, these are in the early stages. Some are still uh, in the beta version. The tube is already a long time that is running. Uh, also, Steam is a long time that is running. But uh, there, are, there is a lot of uh, options to choose for. So maybe sometimes people want to publish here and there. Just copy and paste, you know, no, no much, but that gives uh, a present in the early days, also in the centralized platform. Now decentralized finance, this is a, a particular topic. I am now a financial advisor, so I'm not suggesting any of you to do any risky financial uh, investment. But uh, this is uh, something that is very fascinating to me because if uh, the birth of cryptocurrency scared the banks, the central banks, because oh, there are other money, and I thought that was relatively important, uh, 
Decentralized finance is something that is actually uh, should be a big concern for financial institutions. I saw somebody tweeting, uh, it's not the Lambo story, because you know all the crypto people is when Lambo to the moon, when Lambo, no, in the meaning when I can buy myself a Lamborghini with the money that I'm making investing in crypto. And this guy says it's not a Lambo story. But I bought a family car with a loan from one of these uh, DeFi system. I went there. I didn't have to fill any form. I didn't have to tell my name or anything. I got uh, the loan. I did pay back uh, monthly. I paid my interest on it. Left as collateral other crypto that I didn't want to sell. And then uh, finish, and I have the car. It's paid off in five minutes, done everything. And I think if... Uh, the user interface becomes safe and easy, such that my mother can use it. Banks have lost one third of their business because besides big corporations that do other things, the normal person, why would they choose to go through the headache, uh, the embarrassment as well to be refused a loan with a bank or with other institution, risk to pay interest that are crazy in the hand of somebody that can change the rules under your feet without you knowing, when here you are based on mathematics and guarantee. Truth is that also many of these DeFi smart contracts get hacked, people lost a lot of money. It's early stage, early days, and any sort of things can happen. So again, I, for principle, never used it. I have a friend that actually started with 20,000 euro and arrived to almost 1 million. And then with Terra Luna, there was this potential stable coin, means a, a coin that should have a value stuck to dollar or stuck to euro, stuck to whatever. They didn't work out well. <laughs> he lost half of a million dollars. He was quite depressed. He came to Bali to have a vacation to relax a little bit. But uh, is uh, uh, for sure risks that as nobody asks your name when you subscribe to these things, nobody has a name that you can go to and protest, uh, you know, because they are in fact decentralized, so they have no practical owner. <clears throat> so this is uh, the plus and the minus. But. If as a digital nomad I start getting paid in crypto and there is a safe place, there's a good reputation and I want to put a little bit of money there to earn uh, you know, income on uh, when money gets loaned out, et cetera, et cetera, is an opportunity for, for sure. Another thing that is amazing, there are a lot and a lot are coming up new, crowdfunding uh, decentralized places. So we all know Kickstarter, uh, we all know Indiegogo, GoFundMe, other things like that. Uh, that are centralized and it takes a lot of money as a fee. There are uh, those that are decentralized. Uh, uh, the first one that has been created was called the DAO and has had a particular story of being hacked. Uh, uh, actually, they pointed the finger to a friend of mine as the hacker, potentially, uh, Toby. But I don't know. I don't think it's him. Uh, I was there when all this thing <laughs> happened anyway. There was the big question is, is the code law? So if somebody make a piece of software that allow you to actually withdraw all the funds and the software does it, uh, and you use just the software this other person do, I am committing a crime or not? <laughs> I don't know, in effect, if somebody leaves the door open at home and you enter to steal the content of the house, you're still committing a crime, but uh, less than if you force and break a door, but I don't know. But it was, it was interesting, but anyway, there are a possibility to uh, crowdfund uh, for projects uh, that you can have a true decentralized system. And again, money are easier on crypto because uh, people had, uh, most of the big whales had the money in an easy way. Um, there are insurances as well, they are decentralized. One, uh, one beautiful one was on flights. So you are taking a flight and then you can buy the decentralized insurance. If the flight is late, automatically you get paid. If not, uh, uh, the money goes on the funds, which is, was pretty interesting and practical. All right, and just to conclude uh, the point that we have seen, uh, then <clears throat> I'm very happy to uh, you know, discuss more things, explain more things, answer any questions. Uh, uh, but we saw what is decentralization, pretty much. How does it relate uh, with uh, the digital nomad life? Why some stuff is easier when decentralized compared to centralized, right? Um, security, privacy, autonomy, uh, precise identity that work from everywhere. <clears throat> 
how to do charter through the centralized system, uh, how to store your data in the centralized system, uh, how to go in a marketplace in the decentralized system, uh, uh, social media, and monetization for content in the centralized system, um, decentralized finance, uh, and uh, all this. So now if uh, you guys have any question, uh, I'm happy to try to answer it. I don't know how long it went. I went like uh, about 40 minutes, which is 45 minutes, which is good. Okay, and then we have also somebody after you. Your yeah, microphone is in the chair there. <coughs> okay, so thank you so much, Roberto. This this has um, it's been more than two years. You you are. Um, we are in contact and you've been in the community, but this is the first time we could actually have you as a speaker. Thank okay. you so much for your valuable it's contribution. It's not easy to take me out of the cave, but uh, you know, today it happened. We did it. <laughs> it's worth it. Thank you so much for coming um, from pleasure. Ubud and um, joining us. Um, so sometimes, um, especially when you show that um, what um, digital nomads need slide, most of the um, uh, functions they have, um, I think they're easier to do it centrally. Um, and when, when it comes to the decentralization, my feeling is always, and there's a, I mean, the um, general narration is always like that too. Um, everything to like decentralized streaming, decentralized data storage, and um, most of the similar functions is almost always like not that cost effective, not, um, um, hard to build, and um, oh, yeah. there's always like um, big uh, data storage um, issues, and so it comes to. But then you show the second slide, and that's basically everything you can find for um, an ideology, basically. So, um, and I think, like I, I'm talking and promoting most of the times, ideology is way more important than little costs um, and all the uh, ease and fast um, technology side. What do you think about this? Well, like, that, I mean, are we not yet there? Is it because of that? But no, that there is a starting point. Somewhere you need to start, right? So it's an inevitable uh, way to go, to go ahead. I have... Two analogy that are interesting. I remember because I'm very old. I think I'm like 120 years old. Uh, I look 25, you know. But <laughs> when I was a kid, uh, recycled paper came out. It didn't exist before, okay? And recycled paper was way, way, way more expensive than normal paper. So, uh, like a school uh, booklet, uh, not about the in recycled paper, would cost like five times the one on normal paper. Now, recycled paper is way cheaper than normal paper because it's shit, you know, like next to it. Uh, but uh, they had to start somewhere. I think Tesla, Elon Musk started making the Roadster, the most expensive car, and then slowly, as the production capacity grow, is going to the cheapest model, right? So whenever you start, you have a high, high cost. So uh, it, it, it was true, it is uh, true and not true. Uh, but uh, unless there is uh, somebody financing a startup and covering some of the cost, which is happening a lot, uh, if you think uh, the chat GPT that there is now out, uh, that thing costs a fortune of money. For every time people use it a second, uh, they pay a lot of, this is a machine that is incredibly big uh, to just answer uh, the, the question. It's fascinating. I can spend hours in front of it because it's incredible. Uh, this is centralized. Uh, that's, I'm working with a company to uh, doing my consulting to decentralize uh, artificial intelligent in a network because that's very important, but that's all another story. Another analogy that is interesting is uh, the fax, which we spoke earlier, and the email. So when, uh, again, I was uh, not very little, but the uh, internet came out, so to send an email to somebody, you need to turn on your computer, which takes some time to boot. Once it's booting, you need to connect to the internet, which has this connection, uh, which takes a long time. Then you open your uh, uh, mail application, and which it loads, then you start editing a new email, uh, write the email, uh, send it, uh, wait to re upload it to the mail server, and then uh, disconnect. Then most of the time, we're calling the other person, say, hey, I sent you an email, did you receive it? <laughs> because you were not sure. While a fax, uh, 
take a piece of paper, write whatever you need, put inside, it's gone. In a second, it was in the other side. So people were saying, this email thing is stupid, will never catch up, uh, never, people will never use it. Uh, fax is so much practical, more practical, right? Now if I need to send an email or somebody send me an email, I get a notification. It takes one microsecond on my cell phone to send it out. A fax will be a pain in the butt because I need to start writing or printing or writing, putting, j -j 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 go inside, it's gonna take forever. Now, all this decentralized technology is the email to the fax uh, that is the centralized technology that we have now. With their mostly not much of matter of speed, but the risk and the need of trust uh, for a central entity that uh, doesn't uh, mess with our data, with our accounts. Uh, so we are, it's not in our hand, it's in their hand. And this is uh, sometimes a tragedy for people that lose everything because it's in somebody else's hand. So yes, answering to you, Melissa, it's true, probably uh, it's easier, but I think I said that at the beginning, like it's easier centralized, so it can be a pain in the butt to try to work only the centralized. But it's the beginning of a, movement and in a few years it's going to be the majority so it's going to be the email to the fax yeah I, I mean exactly because at the beginning then we need to care about the ideological part of that it because helps. recycling also comes with an ideology like so it comes with like an awareness and uh, ca caring about the uh, privacy and everything right that's why i bought my tesla many years ago to support elon musk <laughs> yes um, uh, Roberto, nice to see you in person, by the way. We've had a uh, few conversations on Telegram. All oh, right, okay. Um, but it's nice to see you in person. I hope it was a good conversation. Yes, yes, of course, <laughs> informative. <laughs> um, I'm sorry I came late to your talk, so you might, I might have missed that you might have covered this topic. Um, but I wanted to hear your opinion on a pet peeve I have about our industry, which is that uh, the industry is uh, approximately 14 years, 13 years old now. Um, yet we're still uh, hinging on elementary definitions of, uh, categorical definitions of uh, decentralization. So for example, whether a system is centralized or whether it's decentralized, it seems like uh, it, it's about time we need to mature and come up with um, scientific, quantitative, statistically rigorous, empirically supported um, measures of how decentralized the system is. Um, and there have been some approaches, so Nakamoto coefficient is one of them, but it's a, a fairly flawed, I think, by this point, uh, the more I look at it. Um, I wanted to get your opinion on, on how important it is to kind of move on into a more uh, mature way of looking at uh, how we categorize or quantitate oh. systems um, as decentralized or how decentralized systems Yeah, there are be. only seven billion people in the planet. If we want, we can start writing emails to everybody <laughs> 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 to inform them that this. Well, I do believe that uh, the regular user doesn't know what happened behind the scene. And this is gonna be forever like that. So it's more uh, a worry for people providing a service uh, or coming out to, with a service. So there are three aspects that I consider this. It's not really fair to say that the, the industry is 13 years old because uh, it didn't have a head start like, you know, like uh, it, just for people to understand what the blockchain is today, nobody does, okay? So we're far from uh, having it culturally accepted, okay? But uh, for example, Facebook changing the name to Meta, now everybody talk about Metaverse, even if it is this micro, ooh, Metaverse, you know, like, uh, so we need uh, some movement of this sort to make people start thinking. So first, uh, people don't know what happened behind the scene and they don't need to know what happened behind the scene. The responsibility is from the service providers. Third, uh, there is the illusion of decentralization. Now, People don't think, when you use the blockchain, ah, I sent a Twitter to somebody else, I did everything decentralized. No, you connect it to an internet provider that serves one third of your country. So practically that's a bottleneck, is a place where everybody goes, you can be censored and everything, or monitored if you want. Your wallet doesn't talk with the blockchain directly, but talk with a proxy server that talks with the blockchain. 99% of the wallet do that. Uh, which is uh, not decentralized at all. When we read data from the blockchain, now very few blockchain have an API response that nodes can give that you can say, but most uh, you go through Infura, you go through some centralized service that give you the information. Consider that Ethereum, uh, which has been a huge evolution in uh, making things decentralized, uh, it's bad, it's not, it's not architected properly to do things in a proper way. 
But uh, the same reason why Bill Gates created an issue with 640K of memory limit when they started this MS-DOS and so on. Uh, now, this is a story many people say, what is talking about? Uh, practically, when Bill Gates created the Microsoft DOS, uh, there was the interface with command line, uh, the computer, he put uh, a memory limit to 640 kilobytes, so less of one megabyte, uh, that uh, any software can address. Before the software could address the rest of the memory, say you have a computer with four megabytes, you need to have a special application that just bridge, so make two loops every time you need to write. Uh, and these uh, remain as a limit until Windows 98, I think, uh, so, or, or further uh, even, because they were all application built on top of those. And uh, he slowed down the evolution of the capacity of software because uh, the capacity to address memory blocks is important when you, uh, when you develop software. I'm not gonna bore you with this thing, but uh, a choice, because it became popular, they created a huge, a huge big issue. And uh, Ethereum, uh, with all the love I have for Vitalik, uh, which has relatively influenced uh, on how things been done uh, by Gaming and others, uh, has uh, a horrible <laughs> architecture. If you think, when there is a, uh, a coin, uh, say USDC, okay, this is a smart contract uh, that has its own database with a coin. When you have an NFT, it's another smart contract with its own database. So there is nowhere written in Ethereum machines uh, what my address owns. So there is now a place that says Tia's address, there is Roberto has one coin, one NFT, one other thing. You need to go from the day zero, read all the blockchain and build a separate database that has something related to the, so there is no way to notice information unless I query from each single smart contract to know what NFT I own. So let's say you transfer me one monkey because you spend the half million and you're generous, thank you. Actually, I give you my address later. But <laughs> I will have no, no way to know it because the, in the decentralized manner I'm talking, okay? The way that I know it is through centralized services because this centralized service build the information structure that I need to get this information, but which means I need to trust them. Because if uh, uh, my cousin is the IT guy of one of these services, he can modify the database and show that I have the monkey when I don't have it, you know? And when I query, this shows, this is, goes with MetaMask. The MetaMask guy actually was uh, here in Bali for many years. And uh, MetaMask in reading, but not because it's his fault, because there is no other way using Fura, use a decentralized service. So there is still time to create something that is fully, to answer your question and coming back, sorry. There is still time before something is really decentralized. Now we are testing the idea, but the truth is that when we think we're doing the centralized thing, we are not. <laughs> So, so time, time will tell. You want to ask something? Yes. <laughs> See, we should have cut off this presentation because it's more interesting the chat we're having now. <laughs> yeah, I think it's very interesting what you're talking about the decentralized uh, file systems and the you know the storage data storage being decentralized because that's the really the what um, hindering us to scale. Um, you know, like really scale, like in a, tr in a true sense. If you really want to create a distributed application, you really, the data storage have to have very fast IOPS, have to have a replication capability that, you know, syncs like, you know, ins to all the nodes and then, you know, make it work. But it's, it's, uh, it seems like that if that is actually technically possible, and yeah. uh, what is it that, what's actually right. your killer app for that? Because Okay, yeah. well, well, this is a very good question. And actually, I wrote a book that uh, if you want them, give you a copy somehow someday. Uh, but you can download uh, for free online. The problem that there is is this. A blockchain uh, compared to uh, an application, normal application, has a legacy that uh, need to be respected. It means that if you program Microsoft Word, okay, and you want to add uh, some function to Microsoft Word, then you make Microsoft Word 2.0 with a new button that uh, makes uh, something, okay? But if you already start the peer-to-peer -peer network which has a protocol and live on that protocol, uh, you need to do a hard fork to shift uh, to something new. 
and is, uh, believe me, one of the most risky and difficult things. And we know by history with the Bitcoin and others what happened with the defaulted uh, hard forks. And practically, uh, unless uh, something is taught from the zero to work in a certain way, it will hardly be able to transform and become something that works like this. Um, the second problem is uh, most of the blockchain that are around are a clone of something else. There is very little fantasy or bravery. I spent three million US dollars invested in creating a new protocol, okay? They're allowed to do these things, scales in a different way. I am a geek, I am not a marketer. Nobody gave a crap about what I did, okay? I still have it in a drawer there. We do, we do. It is, it is fact. Uh, as I, the, the fact I need to, to marry somebody that is able to bring the voice out uh, and, uh, and or give it a use case. I've I been in two layer one. This last one that I cry if I think, but it's still valid. It's not thrown away, it's still good. And one previous one called NXT, Next. It was the first proof of stake uh, uh, blockchain, the first known clone of Bitcoin because there were Litecoin and all the others, okay? And it was uh, a platform for the centralized application. So you had uh, a marketplace, you had a voting system, you had uh, many other uh, uh, many other things. Uh, and, and practically, people value the quality of a, a blockchain by the value of the coin. So you have a blockchain like Solana with the code that there is horrible program like crap in a hurry, okay, they in fact had all the trouble that he had, eh? but marketed very well. The coin value is up, uh, people think, ha, this is a unicorn, it's the best blockchain around in the market. You have some pieces of gold uh, of code, uh, fantastic ideas like this, uh, that are not marketed properly, and then uh, people consider them zero. So that's why I'm waiting to the, and I have it now after FTX uh, collapse and all these things, and now uh, all the other are going bankrupt, one in like a domino. A decentralized exchange that is really cross-chain. So you can send Bitcoin in the Bitcoin blockchain, and you can receive Ethereum in the Ethereum blockchain. Not with smart contract bridges, there are crap, but we real, database penetration between the blockchain. And it's there, and now I'm discussing with a few people, seeing that uh, a collective of Celsius X users that lost money are going to invest one Bitcoin each to make this thing happen. But you know, if any of you is interested to finance it, I need $5 million, what? just come to me with the $5 million and talk. <laughs> Just out of interest, uh, also a comment about Nextcoin. I think Nextcoin's architect and um, pseudonymous um, inventor is one of the, um, he's a brilliant um, software the, engineer. The guy that did the architect yeah. uh, NXT. I think he's is is the same guy that did IOTA. Yeah, he, he got outed later, right? He, he chose he to did, out himself. He did a fantastic thing, uh, but he came out, people, I'm asking, he, there was somebody that was speaking in his behalf, which was always him, uh, with right. the pseudonym of uh, Come From Behind. And uh, his uh, name was, uh, uh, oh my God, I He's Russian, anyway, think, right? BTC Next was BTC called. Next, that's right. Yeah, they're yep. Russian, yep, yep, correct. Yep, yep. And uh, uh, I don't want to say, I mean, I know them all, okay? Yeah. <laughs> and they have such difficult personalities, such difficult yeah. personalities, and this is what killed them uh, in the opportunity to make something bigger what they had. Uh, with all respect, I mean, I love them all, brilliant people, genius people, but uh, the most difficult person. <laughs> that's, that's because geek people is like this. I am, you know, I am one of the few brave enough to sit here and talk to you, but uh, most of the people is like, eh, don't look at me, you know, like, uh, yeah. and. Uh, um, I, I was gonna comment about your last comment. I think you, you talked about Iota, no. What, Iota. No, no, the, after next you talk about something else. I was gonna, uh, never mind. Maybe ah, the, what he did, because that's what you were saying. So, like uh, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, which I have an idea who he is, uh, uh, somebody in the UK, but uh, he, Not he publishes right. private key. So, which is next, uh, publishes private key so that anybody could sign in CBF. Yep. So, everybody is him, literally, you so know, like, and <laughs> this is a way to eliminate the possibility even to himself to claim to be him. It's a cryptographic uh, suicide. You, it's you, you commit suicide it's, by it's, doing it's, yeah. it's, it's beautiful. It's fantastic, yeah, it. yes. 
Yeah, yeah. No, I, and it's been a beautiful adventure with NXT until a certain point. I think I am one of the first or only people to recover stolen uh, crypto um, because at the time there was no huge, uh, huge traffic, but it wasn't a big amount of money, but follow the money, get to the exchange, uh, frozen the account of the person, uh, given the proof. I had to go to the police to report stolen uh, NXT, and they were looking at me like I had no idea what I was talking about. So I wrote the thing by myself. Thank God I've worked many years with the police, so I know them in Italy. And uh, and in English, uh, we managed to, to get uh, this uh, uh, exchange in China to actually return the funds. Uh, has been quite quite amazing. Though. No, I, I just remember my question, by the way, sorry. Um, <laughs> you mentioned uh, a, a truly cross-chain exchange yes. uh, technology. Um, it's 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 a, it's a big interest of mine. I I, I actually uh, love the way Thorchain accomplishes that. It's through incentives and not bridges. It's it's, it's really and he's also pseudonymous. All, although he's outed himself on a uh, by accident on Zoom, <laughs> he's um, also a young uh, genius programmer. Uh, what technology were you referring to? The, the, what you're looking at right now? Well, um, when we created ZBC, which was his layer one uh, based on proof of participation. The method of the architecture of this uh, uh, consensus mechanics has uh, allowed to create subset of nodes uh, that uh, uh, have a particular function. So if you think you, let's say you have a thousand nodes, you can create uh, 10 group of 100 nodes each. Each of these 100 nodes will run both uh, ZBC and uh, one other blockchain, say Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum, uh, or whatever else. This is done by what, whoever is participating. In this way, uh, the software can go and read the, the database of the other blockchain directly. So the SQL database, no smart contract thing. So whatever action happen in the other blockchain uh, is intercepted and can create an action in the internal blockchain. So because it's also address uh, uh, eclectic, uh, you can use the same private key you use uh, in Bitcoin, uh, for example, to sign a transaction inside this blockchain. So if you, let's say, deposit one Bitcoin, this created the equivalent Bitcoin inside the, the exchange. You can use the same private key you use there to sign the transaction to exchange with Ethereum, for example. And then on the other side, there is a method to send to the address that is being indicated, the exchange. So it is, it is quite interesting and great also, answering the question of the guy before about uh, having a file system, uh, the possibility to run application because you have a full web interface, uh, a website that comes from the uh, storage system itself uh, and has uh, active functions. So you can have a, a group of 100 nodes that run a virtual machine with the software and there is consensus on the result of a transaction on that software. So you can code your application in C, in Python, doesn't matter, it's not a smart contract. It's an actual application that can have its phases in life until it's uh, uh, frozen to one uh, release. But it's, it's beautiful because you can create an application and grow it with time. So, and, and it's a full application, it's not like a smart contract, right? Sorry, more questions about the storage. <laughs> So is the um, is, is your distributed file system or the IPFS actually is it is it does it support um, file based access as well as block based access? I cannot really hear you. That, I mean IPFS. Uh, But practically, IPFS is just a clone of torrent, uh, BitTorrent. Uh, so files, uh, yeah, pretty much, yes. If you think the, I mean, I'm not talking about the software. If you think, when you put a file in IPFS, uh, this file uh, has uh, the hash of the file's name. So you cannot edit the file. I cannot have a file that I can keep accessing, modifying, and whenever people read it, it's changed at the moment. Uh, once you upload it, it's gone. So is that's what it is. And uh, this is the same. Uh, with the torrent, uh, pretty much, that uh, the file that is uploaded as an hash, and that's the hash of the file, and that's it. There is no, you can create folders, subfolders in IPFS, yes, uh, but uh, it's not flexible as an actual file system, where you can have private file, uh, user permission to access files, and other things, right? Uh, so. Um, I was just going to comment on your question, by the way. Just uh, So uh, the, the issue with IPFS, at least originally, uh, Designed was that the persistence problem wasn't addressed, so th um, and that's what I think they have Filecoin attached to it, right? But I don't know. I haven't used Filecoin, but Filecoin is supposed to be the 
incentive layer to uh, guarantee some sort of persistence in IPFS. Um, but there are other uh, decentralized file sharing. Yeah, um, storage, yeah. there is main, uh, Actually, one of the first blockchain uh, decentralized file sharing applications, right? Storage. I think it's more and more you can actually like put the uh, you know database and the relational database or anything that's like but more transactional basis, you know, to really like uh, you do require very high IOPS storage and the you know. Y some yeah, of that, no, yeah. This, is, this, is a, this is an interesting aspect. I'm, I'm sorry for everybody that is not technical because we, we are now in a tunnel of technology. So please stop us or ask a different question if you want to go in another direction. But uh, just to answer your thing, um, in a blockchain you have the consensus mechanics, which is something people don't really understand what it is, and it may be worth an explanation as well. And then there are the transactions. So in transaction, you have transaction types that do different function that if they are not correct by mod, the, the, the transaction is bounced, right? These transaction types may allow you to create applications that are distributed because uh, the Ethereum virtual machine is a transaction type, right? if, you, if you think about it, right? So a database can be a transaction type. So I can have the transaction type database where I can create my query, my add data with a fee corresponding to the payload that you are working with. And this will be an easy solution to have a, a global database in a blockchain where you can have a user with their data and whatever. Obviously, privacy here is only by encryption. So there is no privacy done differently. but. Uh, you can, in effect, uh, have a database that can be the base for application that run uh, from files. And so you need to have the capacity to edit. If you edit only database, it becomes annoying because you need to include a sort of PHP as a transaction type as well <laughs> in order to, uh, or, uh, or a mask. But there are uh, better solutions that are more uh, similar to what we do today that can be implemented. I haven't seen them out, but I know for a fact that can be done, so that's... That's something we're working on. As soon as we have more money, we we'll keep going. <laughs> cool, thank you. Okay. Nobody has questions. How much is my weight? What? <laughs> <laughs> Pay me in Bitcoin. <laughs> I have to. Um, so, obviously, there's on-chain decentralization, and um, but we don't need that actually. Like we can um, totally apply that as a principle whenever we are. Um, governing anything whenever we are um, implementing any information sharing um, structure. Um, but obviously, if we want to do that with masses, we need a s certain structure to keep it as it is, keep, like, to do what it's supposed to do, basically. But I want to um, ask you, like, wh what's your opinion in terms of, like, for instance, like, let's say running S21 or your company, how important is it and how can we actually implement some decentralization um, principles right. in the actual organizational structure? Because that's very hard. I'm absolutely correct. Uh, the governance uh, is one second effect, but also the incipit of a project is, uh, is key. The, having had a company like Blockchain Zoo, right, uh, that now is a little bit small, but used to be quite, quite big, uh, and every client daily income, we need a blockchain. For what? Uh, we need a blockchain. It seems like when everybody needs a website without knowing why, right? The, 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 the only thing that a decentralized system should not be owned or managed by a single entity, because then it's centralized, right, as, as principle. So it should be a collective uh, initiative. That's why I feel I am not a Bitcoin maximalist. I think proof of work is an horrible consensus mechanics, uh, and I apologize for having things differently. Yes, obviously, <laughs> proof of work is, is, is bad as a concept. Uh, but Adam Beck, which is Satoshi Nakamoto, used that uh, to fight spam. You know Adam Beck? Yeah, I think he's... Is that, is that your guess of Satoshi? He is Satoshi Nakamoto, 99%. The code for proof of work is what he, he implemented himself many years earlier to fight spam. He had this idea, if each email people send out has to do a proof of work on the content of the email to come out with an hash that match, a mail server, when receive the mail, verify if the proof of work has been done properly, 
People cannot spam around because it's going to take you like uh, 30 seconds, one minute to validate an email. So if you want to send out 1,000 email, uh, how can you do, right? Uh, consider there was no ASICs and stuff at the time. The mechanics and codes are identical to the proof of work uh, implemented in the first versions of uh, Bitcoin. But... Uh, I, I also have my opinion on... Oops who might be Satoshi. Um, I don't think it's Adam Back. No. Uh, 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 actually, referring to the code, Adam Back is a very proficient uh, C++ coder. Satoshi was not. His code was horrible. I mean, the, the first code was in three files, right? The, the first code that he gave for review for security was a horrible code. And he had been working on it for a year. Do you know anybody who works on a full C++ program who keeps any, everything in one file? Uh, this is a beautiful discussion. We should go <laughs> dinner together and bring it ahead, but uh, yeah. But the beautiful thing at the end of the day is that nobody knows uh, who Satoshi Nakamoto is. You know, discussions like this are most common uh, between people that is trying to find uh, the truth there. And this is why Bitcoin, uh, even though, again, I don't share the technology, I don't think it's good and all, uh, is a real decentralized project in a certain way because it came from the community support for a common interest, for everybody's interest. And this should be, to answer Melissa's question, the base that push any decentralized project. So either you are a Samaritan and say, I'm doing this for the world, okay? Or you put yourself ahead and say, look, I have an idea and a capacity to implement something for the common good. Can the public participate a little bit each, and you become also the people that run the node? That was my intent with UBC, for example. The funding would have been done by people purchasing an NFT that correspond to the data and the key to run one node in the Genesis block. And then this launch, the things, is decentralized. People can go check Ethereum blockchain and check uh, uh, you know, the Genesis block of UBC is identical, so I didn't tamper with things and it started off. True is that he was money to put the investors, no time to run a node. So that I created a conflict for which I, I raised five people, I put the rest of my own money, disaster. Now I do this, I say, who want to invest in the centralized exchange has an NFT that corresponds to shares of the income, and then who runs a node? as income on his own. It doesn't have to pay to run the node. You're already doing the job. Maybe it's going to work better. <laughs> I don't know. So we have 10 more minutes. I'm, I'm just going to follow up. Um, so there's this implementation uh, level. For, for instance, for, decentral I mean, for Bitcoin, um, it's an infrastructure, basically. It's not the content of the, uh, the transactions that is going to be the, um, implemented in the, um, on blockchain. Um, for everything else, for instance, content creation or like running a company or um, there's an inf basically an information um, hierarchy and information um, discrepancy. Like it's not enough, n not all that um, notes you want to de if you want to decentralize running a company, for instance, not all the nodes have the same information um, that might be um, needed to um, to run and like to do the job. So, um, and I'm thinking, for instance, um, it's a very easy thing, like verif verification of uh, blocks. And it was a, an amazing product market fit, if you think about Bitcoin at that time. It's um, all the coders um, at that time have the um, right knowledge and capacity to participate. And there is a um, good measurement of uh, their contribution. Um, and it's central, uh, decentralized in that way. So you can actually include their participation. But how it with anything that has um, that, that's more information um, dependent, how can be um, like measured? Uh, because that's There's really hard to measure in mathematical terms to like uh, standardize the. Um, no, that the doesn't process. mean like uh, data have a weight, right? Uh, so in terms of uh, capacity storage or processing power, you can always calculate how much the, the size and the processing is. Uh, this is done very well with smart contract in Ethereum, right? So Ethereum charge a fee, a gas. They call it, right, uh, based on uh, uh, the, the transaction uh, that, uh, that you're doing. But uh, I think the problems are 
are different. With, the, with Bitcoin and with all the blockchain, uh, uh, because of the mechanics uh, of consensus, uh, the prize is won by the person that created the new block, right? Uh, um, which makes uh, all the other nodes, they are there making sure that the blockchain is authentic because they are there to reject things. Doing this work uh, as a voluntary work, uh, nobody is paying them. Uh, mostly in, in Bitcoin, where everything end up uh, centralized because there are like a handful of company that create new blocks. Uh, so, <clears throat> beside the fact that they can censor transactions, so if these 12 companies sit at the table and say, "Hey, this wallet cannot spend money," every time the wallet try to post a transaction, they will never include it in a block. Uh, and this is censorship, right? So it's not true that it's censorship resistant. Second, the need of a thousand, ten thousand nodes to verify the quality of the block is not rewarded. In proof of participation, we do the opposite. We punish the account that doesn't generate the block when it's his turn to generate the block, okay? <clears throat> because this is done through a sort of a federated group of nodes. You know who has the turn. When he misses because he's offline other things, he loses the participation score. And the revenue of the new coin generated new block is distributed among all the nodes that qualify to create new blocks. So in this way, you actually pay people for the work that they're doing in maintaining the network up. If the network is used to make a phone call, video calls, uh, I don't know, video streaming, rather than uh, hosting data, et cetera, et cetera, nothing changes. Uh, is a, always a way to remunerate uh, people that uh, offer the tools uh, to give the service uh, that, is, uh, that is given. How the effect is on the other side, say people vote uh, for uh, a decision or something else, uh, <clears throat> this is uh, an external choice, right? Uh, but on the technical aspect, uh, a computer doesn't know what, what is happening, what the test contain, right? Uh, so it's just uh, measuring uh, the, the cost uh, on term of data size and uh, and uh, work done to, to process it. Because I'm usually, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to comment as well. Uh, um, as soon as you said that, when uh, you mentioned that either the entire uh, infrastructure doesn't need to necessarily know about all bits of information, um, sharding is, is, is one way that that's achieved, but there's a, um, obviously a compromise to how decentralized the system is. The more it's sharded, the less decentralized it is. Um, I, I also wanted to uh, mention that uh, zero knowledge proofs provide another way to summarize data without actually having to um, have all of the data, right? So um, MENA protocol, for example, um, their blockchain is just 30 kilobytes forever to uh, cryptographically verify that uh, every single transaction that you may want to verify can be verified. So there are some techniques, but it's obviously a little harder. Yeah, and also uh, it's beautiful to talk in theory, but when you sit in front of the computer and start coding this thing, you're going to realize that there are some uh, obstacles that are not uh, covered in the theory part. <laughs> and I assure you of that. <laughs> okay, okay, so then. <laughs> so um, I just want to... Um, like finalize with a couple of um, remarks and uh, to have it from you for the uh, the nomads. Like I'm gonna add, because I mean each time I'm thinking about decentralization, obviously um, there's more than that. Like we're talking about days and nights about decentralization and it's like advocating it, like and all that. And eventually, when we're making any decisions, it just comes to like a counterpoint like you decide <laughs> and the rest of the people obey kind of situation and this is most of this is the case for most of the uh, mm. because it's very hard to start um decentralization um, the, the, um at first that, that's that's why we have layers right so we talk about layer one which is the ba the bottom infrastructure and people can build on top of it right so there are some very complex geeky thing that uh, geeky people do and then there are the beautiful uh, user-friendly interfaces with things that Hopefully other people do. And no, but that's how it works, right? Uh, so uh, unfortunately, then the people that make the most money is the people that build on top of something else. But even, even when we are thinking about, because I, I um, think about um, participation of the uh, uh, nodes, um, contributing to the network security and being compensated by that is, is an amazing, um, metaphor to ap uh, apply any collective effort basically so when we are doing like an event like participation and the community um, compared to any mass 
Um, it's basically something like that, right? It's like it, when everybody contributes, everybody gets something more than what they contribute. Mm -hmm. So it's there's this kind of like cohesive structure, and the uh, compensation and contribution is defined by the uh, by a f by the function. So like you come to an event, you uh, contribute to a thing. Like we do different things. Like these are like way easier part to to sort the problem. Um, for the like, I mean, t just take it as an analogy and like try to um, build a whole community or a culture around it. It still can uh, be an inspiring um, notion for for most of us, right? Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, the, it, there is this need. That some some weird things need to start and need to be adopted. Uh, I'm I'm really not an expert in this thing. I am uh, actually I tried and, and I failed. <laughs> That's what we do. But um, okay, so what? What would be your final remarks? Like, if you are um, any digitally involved um, professionals, um, be it a like web designer or a digital marketer or um, any common digital nomad uh, profession, maybe Ichi would help us to understand uh, what would be the be most common um, digital nomad profession. Um, what would be the technology they should? definitely be aware of? Uh, what would be the products they should definitely be aware of? Well, I, in general, <coughs> I, what I said at the beginning is in fact that uh, this is something that is coming. So decentralization is one phase of the evolution of the information era. We start from analog, analog to digital, digital we transmit data, from transmitting data we can buy service from centralized party. Now we decentralize. We started decentralized with internet, like I think the mail server, each house or office had its own mail server, the mail were traveling from one to the other. Now we all go to three provider of emails, which is totally centralized. We need to re-decentralize a lot of service and a lot of new services, we need to bring them to in a decentralized manner. Uh, it is not complex. Uh, the final user probably will not realize it except for how they log in. Because in a decentralized uh, system, you cannot log in with the username and password simply because uh, you will need the database with all the username and password in each node uh, of the system, which will make it uh, now private. <coughs> but the decentralized system requires a cryptographic signature, so we use the Ledger Nano S that all of us have, uh, rather than uh, some other uh, tools, and uh, like MetaMask, if we don't are moving a lot of money. So this will be for a digital nomad. My biggest suggestion is. Give a look to this, because uh, it's coming. And if you're there first, uh, probably you get the best meal, right? So um, it, it is worth uh, looking. There is no one specific, because every person has a different profession, has different needs. But uh, the video streaming website uh, that can monetize, there are no YouTube. Uh, you know, the mm, medium equivalent, uh, you know, in Steam it and so on. <coughs> I think there are tools that are nice and easy to approach, but if you start Googling it, uh, there are tons and tons of tools uh, that are decentralized and match uh, the, the work people do. So don't, don't go crazy, don't force yourself to live decentralized. They're gonna end up screaming like this lady, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, but give a look at it and try it, and you know make experience and comment, uh, write a blog about it, uh, you know connect with other people. Eventually, it's gonna become the norm. That's I guarantee you that. Yes. Yes. Hello. Yeah, <laughs> you can hear me. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, I would like to apologize about the uh, this uh, event. We didn't know. We didn't know about this, <laughs> that they were actually organizing a party. So um, yeah, sorry about this. Uh, I'm from Tropical Nomad, so uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, in terms of um, usability, I think it's um, uh, most of digital nomads involved in uh, you know, some sort of tech-related services. I mean, I obviously, everybody will use their favorite cloud services to you know, run their apps, and then their database, and their even network, and you know all that, mm. but uh, how? Um, what will be the best way to advise for them to take their traditional, you know, architecture to distributed one and to, you know, is there a like a like how we can actually help them to guide them through for, for that a, transition that is coming? Yeah, I've offered an alternative to the client. Uh, download my work uh, via Dropbox or via IPFS. 
you know, just, just this shows that you are, uh, you know, ahead with it. It's not complicated to upload the file in IPFS. There are millions of providers. You can give a URL. And this is from the centralized world. It can be even be put in an elegant way. If you're a traditional user Dropbox, if you are a web tree person, download it through IPFS. You know, like it can be a joke, it can be fun, but gives an experience for the digital nomad to try. Don't replace, but add as a backup option, uh, you know. And as you find yourself comfortable, uh, you know, and these all these service need feedback as well by real people. Most, most programmers like me, you know, unless I'm intelligent enough to hire somebody that is in the industry that tells me exactly what they want, uh, I can guess only. And trust me, most of the service will be built by people that only is guessing what the user want. <laughs> So, you know, a good feedback uh, is, is good. Uh, we, we are helping to build the next phase uh, of information technology, which is a decentralized way to do things. And, uh, you know, every, everybody can help and be in. So Yeah, we'll love to see, like, incubation programs and, you know, these basically hand-holding them to, like, if that, that business plan is very sound and then that there's a definite economic, you know, definite business case for, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, even somebody yes. has a restaurant, you can download the menu from IPFS, when, you know, like, uh, or you can uh, place an order and pay with uh, Ethereum or USDC, why, why not? I mean, those are small things, alternatives. Paying attention not to break the law, you know, like in Indonesia, you only can sell in rupiah, there's no other way. So unfortunately, that's the law here. Uh, but in other country, it can be done. So, you know, whatever people do, do proper or be a rebel, I don't know what to say, but I'm not suggesting anybody to break the law. <laughs> All right. I have a um, couple of announcements as always. So um, thank you so much, Roberto. Thank you. Um, is that okay? So today here, there was Polkadot, uh, there's Pintu, uh, there is <laughs> the our little island, uh, our little uh, crypto community is getting more and more popular. Uh, as always, we are super. Uh, so, um, Pinto community uh, manager, we are going to be having much uh, more um, joint events now. And um, so we are setting S21 um, as a consultancy company to incubate more and more projects and um, to help from business. Uh, development, the business um, models to um, technical sites, uh, community growth, um, and online and offline event uh, management. And we are also starting um, our community building and networking events in Manila, Philippines, and Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. So we are expanding. <laughs> Thank you so much for your support. Thank you for being here. And um, if you can join the, if any support um, you want to show us, um, a little love to our little Philippines group, a little uh, love to our Malaysia group, uh, feel free to initiate the conversations there. Your experience, your um, feedback, your um, contribution is very, very um, um, valuable. And we're gonna go to dinner from uh, here. Um, it's my birthday, and uh, thank you so much. We're very happy to co uh, celebrate with you. Thank you.